Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, What Employers Need to Know webinar. I'm Brandilyn Bickner, and I'll be your moderator. Today, our presenters will be Carol Miaskoff, Legal Counsel of the EEOC, and Carrie Leibig, Senior Attorney in the Office of Legal Counsel. We're gonna start with some words of welcome from Charlotte Burroughs, the Chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Over to you, Chair Burroughs. Hello, oh, I'm Charlotte Burroughs, Chair of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I'm honored to lead this agency as we prepare to fulfill our new mandate to enforce the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, or PWFA, a new civil rights law enacted with broad bipartisan support which takes effect on June 27, 2023. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited workplace discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. And it was a tremendous step forward in protecting workers' civil rights. But there remained some civil rights issues that were unaddressed or that the courts simply got wrong in later years, including in the area of pregnancy discrimination. Congress went part of the way in closing the gap by passing the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 to protect workers from discrimination based on pregnancy. Later, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 was enacted to provide important protections and a right to accommodation for workers with disabilities, including some workers who experience disability due to pregnancy. Yet despite these laws, many of these workers fell through the gaps and suffered adverse employment actions due to their pregnancies, childbirth, or related medical conditions. Additionally, many employers and workers alike found the standards for when employers needed to provide a reasonable accommodation for pregnant workers, and they found those standards both unclear and confusing. As a result, last December, Congress passed the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act to close gaps in the law and provide much needed clarity. And they tasked us here at the EEOC with implementing and enforcing this new law. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act protects employees and job applicants with limitations related to affected by or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions by requiring employers to give them reasonable accommodations unless doing so would present an undue hardship for the employer. This new law has wide support from businesses, faith, health, women's and civil rights organizations, as well as members of the public. And as I mentioned earlier, it has broad bipartisan support in Congress. The PWFA will help pregnant workers maintain their health and have healthy pregnancies while they continue to work and it will benefit the economy by keeping capable workers in the workforce, thus contributing to the economic growth of our nation. As employers, we know that you are on the front lines of implementing the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act's protections and that you want to get it right. That's why my colleagues and I are here today. The EEOC very much wants to provide as much help as we can to assist all of you in preparing for the new law to take effect this summer. We're holding today's webinar to provide information about the basics of this new law and to help ensure that when it takes effect on June 27th, employers will be ready. The EEOC also has other resources that are available to you, including a technical assistance document on our website and training through the EEOC's Training Institute. In addition, later this year, the EEOC will be issuing implementing regulations that will be available for public comments before they become final. Once the draft rules are published, we hope that you will submit comments on them. While there's much work to do, we at the EEOC are committed to supporting employers as you prepare for the Act's effective date. And there's also much to celebrate as the new law provides important clarity about protections for pregnant workers. It also provides a new tool to better ensure that these workers have fair and inclusive workplaces and that pregnant workers receive the support that they need to remain in the workforce. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I look forward to our program.
Hi, I'm Carol Miaskoff, Legal Counsel of the EEOC. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is a new law that the EEOC will enforce that gives workers with known limitations related to, affected by, or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, the right to reasonable accommodations absent undue hardship on the employer. We are covering several topics at today's training. First, we'll identify the objectives of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, how it fits with existing employment discrimination laws regarding pregnancy, and some important dates for the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, or the PWFA. Next, we'll discuss some of the key definitions in the law, and we will talk about possible reasonable accommodations under PWFA. Then we'll identify specific employer practices that the PWFA prohibits, including retaliation and coercion, and talk about the charge filing process and the relief available if there is a violation. And last but not least, we will talk about how the PWFA fits with other laws, and we will go through some sample fact patterns and answer some sample questions. We will end with slides that provide resources for employers. So let's start at the beginning. Do current laws provide for accommodations for pregnant workers? Thanks, Brandilyn. And hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Liebig, Senior Attorney Advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel. To answer your question, yes, in certain circumstances, two laws that EEOC already enforces that you are likely familiar with are Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, and they both provide protections for pregnant workers. Title VII prohibits sex discrimination, which includes discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, and it prohibits discrimination based on sex in all aspects of employment, so hiring, firing, pay, assignments, promotions, training benefits, or any other term or condition of employment. Additionally, under Title VII, a pregnant worker can get an accommodation if the employer provides the same benefit to non-pregnant workers who are similar in their ability or inability to work. So for example, if a pregnant worker needed a stool to sit on while working, the employer might not be required to provide that stool under Title VII unless the pregnant worker could point to a non-pregnant worker who needed a stool and was allowed to have one or some direct evidence of discrimination, such as a biased comment or a policy that on its face excluded pregnant workers. Now the ADA prohibits discrimination based on disability, again, in all aspects of employment, including hiring, firing, pay, job assignments, promotions, training, benefits, or any other term or condition of employment. Additionally, the ADA requires accommodations absent undue hardship. If the worker has an impairment related to pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition that meets the definition of disability. Under the ADA, a person has a disability if they have a physical or mental condition that substantially limits a major life activity or bodily function. But now, with the PWFA, pregnant workers will also have a direct route for obtaining reasonable accommodation absent undue hardship. And happily for us, the PWFA uses many terms and concepts from Title VII and the ADA. Okay, that makes sense. So when does the PWFA go into effect? The PWFA goes into effect on June 27th, 2023. That means EEOC will start taking charges under the PWFA on June 27th. This means that employers are not subject to the PWFA's requirements until June 27, 2023. Now, as noted on the last slide, under certain circumstances, a pregnant worker already is entitled to uh, accommodations under Title VII or the ADA. So between now and June 27, employers must consider whether either of those two laws entitle the worker to an accommodation. Once June 27th rolls around, the PWFA will also apply. Now, the PWFA requires the EEOC to issue regulations by December 29th, 
2023. And before those regulations are final, draft regulations will be published for public comment. As the chair suggested previously, we encourage you to comment on the proposed regulations. And to ensure you are notified when those proposed regulations are issued, you can register to receive free EEOC news alerts by going to our website, eeoc.gov. Now, because the statute goes into effect in June, there will be a time when the statute is in effect, but the regulations are not final. In some cases, the statute is going to be enough to set out what the PWFA, how it applies and what it requires, particularly because the PWFA incorporates concepts from Title VII and the ADA. Now that won't be true for everything, and we'll be talking about that during this presentation. Okay, great. So what are some of the basic provisions of the PWFA? As Carrie said, Congress passed the PWFA to respond to the fact that some pregnant workers who needed accommodations because of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions were not getting them under the existing laws. Some pregnant workers were losing jobs, were being forced to go on leave, or, or were forced to work without an accommodation. The PWFA responds to these concerns by providing a right for qualified workers with known limitations to get reasonable accommodations absent undue hardship. Sorry. On this slide, in the second bullet, you have the statement of the core legal requirements of the PWFA. And in the next series of slides, Carrie and I are going to talk about each of the terms that's highlighted there and delve into what it means. So let's go through these terms one by one. What's a covered entity? If an employer is covered by Title VII or the Government Employee Rights Act, or GERA, they are covered by the PWFA. So this includes private and public employers with at least 15 employees federal agencies, unions, and employment agencies. The PWFA covers all employees and applicants that are covered by Title VII. So remember that this can include former employees as well. As we will discuss, for certain parts of the PWFA, an employee or applicant must be qualified and have a known limitation. The PWFA covers workers in all industries and all states, as long as the employer employs at least 15 people. The PWFA also covers workers covered under the Congressional Accountability Act, but because the EEOC does not enforce that law, we won't be discussing it in today's training. All right, how about the next one? What's a reasonable accommodation? In the PWFA, Congress says that the definition of reasonable accommodation is the same as under the ADA. Under the ADA, a reasonable accommodation means a change in the work environment or the way things are customarily done. For example, an employer may have a rule that workers can only take breaks at certain times, but pregnant workers often need to go to the bathroom more frequently and to eat and drink at short intervals during the day. So a pregnant worker may need to ask for additional breaks, which will be a change in how things are customarily done due to her pregnancy. Note that the law also protects job applicants who may need reasonable accommodation for pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions in terms of interviews, testing, or other activities that occur at the application stage. So what are some examples of reasonable accommodations under the PWFA? As I said before, a worker may request an accommodation under the PWFA to apply for a job, to do an essential function of their job, to help them have equal terms, conditions, and privileges of employment, or because they need one or more essential functions of the job temporarily suspended. On this slide, we have a list of some examples of accommodations under the PWFA, such as breaks to use the restroom to eat or drink, changes in uniforms or safety gear, changes in work schedules, telework, light duty, or leave. It is important to keep in mind that the list I just read and the list on the slide are only examples. There may be many others. 
And of course, an employer always has a defense if it can prove that the reasonable accommodation causes an undue hardship. And is leave a possible reasonable accommodation? Yes, leave may be commonly requested as an accommodation under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Workers may request leave for different reasons, including appointments with healthcare professionals before, during, or after pregnancy, or to recover from post-pregnancy conditions. As with the ADA, if the employee has a right to leave, for example, sick leave or maternity leave under the employer's existing policies, sick leave or maternity leave under state law or under the federal FMLA, then there will be no need for reasonable accommodation of leave under the PWFA. However, if the employee is not eligible for leave under one of these other policies or laws, or if she has exhausted leave under that policy or law, the employee can seek leave as a reasonable accommodation under the PWFA. Okay, let's go back to our definitions now. I believe the next one is qualified employee. So what does that one mean? Under the PWFA, as Carol said, reasonable accommodations are available for qualified employees or applicants. There are two ways for a worker to be qualified under the PWFA. The first part of the definition of qualified uses language from the ADA, an employer applicant who can perform the essential functions of the position with or without a reasonable accommodation. Essential functions are the fundamental duties of the job. Many workers uh, seeking accommodations will meet this part of the definition because they will be able to perform the essential functions of the job with an accommodation, such as a cashier who needs a stool or a production worker who needs bathroom breaks or a retail worker who needs to carry around a bottle of water. When a worker asks for leave, the question to consider is whether they will be qualified after the reasonable accommodation is leave. And I see that this is a part one slide. So is there a part two to this? Exactly. Under the second part of the definition of qualified, a worker affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or a related medical condition who cannot perform one or more essential functions of the job may still be considered qualified if the following conditions are met. First, the inability to perform the essential function is temporary. Second, the essential function could be performed in the near future. And third, the inability to perform the essential function can be reasonably accommodated. Temporary in the near future and what it means that the inability to perform the essential function can be reasonably accommodated are not defined in the statute. These are things that the EEOC is thinking about for the regulation. For now, there are some examples that may help you think about what this second definition of qualified means. The congressional report that accompanied the PWFA discussed the case of Young v. UPS. In that case, a pregnant worker needed an accommodation that would excuse some essential functions of her job. UPS had a light duty program for workers hurt on the job. And in that program, essential functions were excused, but UPS would not let Peggy Young, the pregnant worker, join the program. This second part of the definition of qualified in the PWFA is part of the response to that concern. For another example, consider an employee who can't travel because of a known limitation under the PWFA and working in person with clients in different locations is an essential function of the position. The reasonable accommodation could be a temporary suspension of travel for that employee. Depending on the circumstances, the employee could be given other job duties that were within her known limit. Now it's important to remember that all we are talking about here is what it means to be qualified. An employer has a defense if it can prove that the reasonable accommodation, temporary suspension of one or more essential functions or another reasonable accommodation causes an undue hardship. It is also important to remember that any suspension of a, one or more essential functions is going to be for a temporary period. And it looks like our next definition is a known limitation. What is that? Under the PWFA, reasonable accommodations are available to qualified employees, as Carrie just explained, or applicants who have a known limitation. What is a known limitation? 
The statute defines it as, quote, a physical or mental condition related to, affected by, or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions that the employees, the employee or the employee's representative has communicated to the employer whether or not such condition meets the definition of disability from the ADA. Okay, there's a lot packed in there. Given what the PWFA definition I just read says, we do know that known, the word known, means that the employee or the employee's representative has communicated or told the employer about the limitation. We also know that limitation is linked to a physical or mental condition related to, affected by, or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. The PWFA says that the limitations does not have to meet the definition of a disability under the ADA. When Congress was discussing the PWFA, it talked about the ordinary realities of pregnancy, thirst, more frequent need to use the restroom, swelling, weight gain, lactation, the need to sit or stand throughout the day. Of course, the limitations associated with pregnancy also may be more serious and may be a disability that is also covered by the ADA. Okay, so how are we then defining pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions? The PWFA does not contain a definition of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. That term is, however, in the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which amended Title VII in 1978. And there are examples about what it means for Title VII in the EEOC's Enforcement Guidance on Pregnancy Discrimination and Related Issues, which you can find on our website, eeoc.gov. And it looks like our last definition is absent undue hardship. What does that mean exactly? Okay, undue hardship is another term that's familiar from the ADA. An employer does not have to provide a reasonable accommodation if it causes the employer an undue hardship under the ADA or under the PWFA. The definition of undue hardship is the same under the PWFA as under the ADA. It means, in general, significant difficulty or expense. However, there are a lot of factors that should be considered when you're assessing undue hardship. The nature and cost of the accommodation needed, the overall financial resources of the facility making the accommodation, the number of people working there, the effect on expenses and resources at the facility. And if the facility is part of a larger employer entity, the whole employer's overall financial resources, size, number of employees, et cetera. We also look at the type of operation of the employer, including the functions and the structure of the workplace, the geographic separateness, the administrative or fiscal relationship of the facility involved in making the accommodation. And finally, the impact on the of the accommodation on the operation of the facility. All right. Thanks for explaining that. So let's say an employee has asked an employer for a reasonable accommodation under the PWFA. What should happen next? The PWFA anticipates that workers and employers will use an interactive process, as that term is understood under the ADA to help determine if the employee has a known limitation under the PWFA and to determine what may be an effective accommodation. The interactive process can be a discussion or other type of interactive communication. It's not something formal and there are no specific steps, required steps or magic words. As we will discuss later, under the PWFA, an employer is prohibited from requiring an employee to take an accommodation other than one arrived at through the interactive process. So that means the interactive process is a key part of what employers should be doing. So now we know that the PWFA requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations absent undue hardship. Um, what other actions does the PWFA require? The PWFA has five prohibited practices. So under the PWFA, an employer may not deny a qualified employee or applicant 
with a no limitation, a reasonable accommodation, absent undue hardship. That's the one we've been talking about mostly today. Number two, an employer may not require a qualified employee or applicant to accept an accommodation other than one arrived at through the interactive process. This provision addresses a situation where an employer requires a pregnant worker to accept an accommodation that they may not need. The third prohibited practice, an employer must not deny an employment opportunity to a qualified employee or applicant because that person will need a reasonable accommodation. Number four, an employer must not require a qualified employee to take leave if another effective accommodation can be provided. This provision gets at a situation where rather than provide an accommodation that would allow the worker to remain on the job, the employer requires them to go out on leave. And the fifth prohibited practice, an employer may not take adverse action in the terms, conditions, or privileges of employment against qualified employees or applicants who ask for or use accommodations under the PWFA. Can you talk a little bit about retaliation and coercion? Yes, it's an important question. The PWFA uses the same language as in the anti-retaliation provisions of Title VII and the ADA. So the PWFA prohibits retaliation against those who participate in the EEO process in any manner or those who reasonably oppose discrimination prohibited by the PWFA. And this includes retaliation for requesting or using a reasonable accommodation. The PWFA's anti-coercion provision uses the same language as the ADA's interference provision. So the PWFA prohibits coercion and interference against those exercising their rights or helping others to exercise their rights under the PWFA. Finally, these provisions apply to all employees, applicants, and former employees. The individual does not have to be someone seeking an accommodation, nor does the individual have to be a qualified employee. And what procedures will the EEOC use to enforce the PWFA? The EEOC is going to use the same procedures as it uses for Title VII and the ADA. Private sector and state and local government workers may file a charge of discrimination with the EEOC or with a state or local agency enforcing state or local employment discrimination laws, also referred to as fair employment practices agencies. A charge is a signed statement asserting that an employer or other covered entity engaged in employment discrimination and asking the EEOC to take remedial action. The PWFA requires an aggrieved person which includes an employee, applicant, or former employee, as Carrie and I have been noting, to file a charge with the EEOC or with one of the Fair Employment Practices Agencies before the person can file a job discrimination lawsuit against the employer. For the PWFA, the person must file within 180 days or 300 days of the discrimination, depending on the state where the discrimination happened. To learn more about what to expect if a charge is filed against you as an employer, go to the EEOC's website, eeoc.gov, and look under employers slash small business and select, quote, after a charge is filed. And let's say something goes wrong, a lawsuit is filed. What type of relief are available under the PWFA? The PWFA's damages procedures are, again, the same as under Title VII, the ADA, and GIRA, including the caps based on employer size. Relief under the PWFA can also include injunctive relief, such as getting a reasonable accommodation. Additionally, like the ADA, money damages under the PWFA can be limited if the case involves providing a reasonable accommodation and the employer shows good faith efforts in consultation with the worker seeking the accommodation to identify and provide a reasonable accommodation. Let's talk about relationships to other laws. Right. Um, Well, we've been alluding to this, I think, throughout the presentation, but there are obviously other federal and state and local laws that cover some of this same turf. Some of the state or local laws may provide more protection to pregnant workers than does the PWFA. For example, some of them may provide paid leave programs. 
nothing in the PWFA limits those greater protections under state or local laws. Workers can bring claims under several laws at the same time. For example, PWFA charges and cases may simultaneously also be brought under Title VII, under the ADA, the FMLA, or state or local laws. In addition, there are some provisions in the PWFA that also have important information. Specifically, nothing in the PWFA can be used to require an employer-sponsored health plan to pay for a particular item, procedure, or treatment. In addition, the PWFA adopts the language in Section 702A of Title VII regarding religious employers' ability to employ individuals of a particular religion. All right, let's talk about some examples. A pregnant cashier asks her supervisor if she can sit while working at the register because of her pregnancy makes it hard for her to stand for long periods of time. Cashiers usually have to stand. Okay, so the cashier has a known limitation, a physical or mental condition, which is the inability to stand for long periods of time, and it's related to the pregnancy. The cashier is qualified with a reasonable accommodation of a stool. So in this circumstance, the employer would have to provide the stool unless it can prove that it would be an undue hardship. All right, let's look at the next example. A pregnant delivery driver asks for light duty work because they cannot lift heavy boxes because of their pregnancy. The employer has a light duty program for workers with on-the-job injuries that excuses them from lifting heavy packages. The employee's lifting restriction is a physical or mental condition related to pregnancy. In terms of accommodation, there may be a way for the employer to provide such an accommodation that helps the employee to lift these boxes. If not, however, we must continue to consider the second definition of qualified and whether the performance of this essential function can be temporarily suspended. The employer would have to provide an accommodation, like temporarily suspending the employee's need to lift heavy boxes or assigning them to a light duty program, absent undue hardship. Okay, let's look at another example. A new call center employee needs time off to attend therapy appointments for postpartum depression. The employee has not earned enough sick leave yet to cover the time away for the appointments. Again, the employee here has a known limitation postpartum depression, and the symptoms of that condition. They need a change in how work is done because they need leave to attend healthcare appointments. This employee will be qualified with the reasonable accommodation of leave to attend the appointments. Now, unless there is a different law or employer policy that provides for paid leave, the leave would be unpaid. But the employer will have to provide that leave or another effective accommodation, such as advancing sick leave, absent undue hardship. And let's look at one more example. A retail worker needs eight weeks of leave to recover from childbirth. The employee does not qualify for FMLA leave and the employer does not offer short-term disability leave. The worker will be able to do the job after the leave is over. Let's go through the analysis again. The worker has a known limitation, recovery from the physical problems resulting from childbirth, and needs a change in working conditions, a reasonable accommodation. From what we know, the employee will be qualified after the reasonable accommodation of leave. The employer therefore will have to provide the leave under the PWFA absent undue hardship. And what are some tips for employers trying to comply with the PWFA? As the PWFA goes into effect, here are some important tips. First, it's important for employers to train supervisors about the PWFA. Employees are likely to go to first-level supervisors with their requests, so first-level supervisors should be trained on how to respond. Second, employers should remember to use the interactive process. Employers should remember that the worker does not need to have a disability or something severe, and that the limitations we're talking about might be related to an uncomplicated pregnancy. And remember that accommodations can be simple. Finally, employers should realize that a worker may need different accommodations as the pregnancy progresses. The worker recovers from childbirth or the related medical condition improves or worsens. For assistance identifying possible accommodations, you can consult the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN, which you can find at askjan.org. 
Jan is a free expert confidential service that helps workers and employers with reasonable accommodations. For example, it has numerous suggestions for industry specific accommodations for pregnant workers, including 40 for lifting divided by industry. So it can be very useful. And what are some other resources that are available for employers? Well, this slide provides you with uh, links to web pages that provide the resources. Um, since Carrie was just telling us about the very helpful Job Accommodation Network, I'll note that the link to Jan, askjan.org, is the second one from the bottom. And Jan is actually a project that is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. There are several of these links are to the EEOC's web pages. Uh, several are to the Department of Labor for laws that they enforce. For example, example, the FMLA and the Pump Act, both of which are obviously relevant to, uh, to pregnancy, childbirth, and related conditions. Let's talk about some other questions employers may have. How can employers ensure that they are complying with laws when there is still ambiguity? Employers can educate themselves through things like this webinar um, and also other useful resources, um, including those on the slide that was just up. And EEOC, of course, has a What You Should Know About the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act on our website, again, eeoc.gov. And also, while it may seem challenging to learn about a new law, in many cases, compliance will be straightforward and involve simple accommodations like providing a stool, breaks for water, food, restrooms. And also remember that the PWFA borrows a lot of terms from Title VII and the ADA, so employers should already have practices in place that will assist with compliance. Again, employers should use the interactive process and discuss what an employee needs. And finally, remember that good faith efforts to provide accommodations may limit damages. Like under the ADA, money damages under the PWFA can be limited if the case involves providing a reasonable accommodation and the employer shows good faith efforts in consultation with the worker seeking the accommodation to identify and provide one. So when do you analyze a request for accommodation under the ADA versus the PWFA? Do you sometimes need to do both? Yes, there will be some conditions that are covered by both laws and may need to be analyzed under both laws. But regardless, the employer only has to give one accommodation. The condition also may change over time and become something that initially was covered under the PWFA, later is covered by the ADA. So okay. the situation may evolve. That makes sense. Um, so let's assume an organization effectively evaluates reasonable accommodations under the ADA. Will the organization be PWFA compliant if it just adds pregnancy to its ADA policy? And what else should an employer do? Well, we do think that some of the ADA procedures will be easily usable under the PWFA because of the similarities in definitions. But it's critical to remember that under the PWFA, accommodations are for known limitations and that those do not require that the definition of disability be met and that the definition of known limitation does not include a requirement of severity. So accommodations may be for something quite simple, like the need to sit, drink, or take a break. Further, uh, employers need to remember that under the PWFA, an employee who cannot do the essential functions of the position may still be qualified because of that second definition. Finally, the PWFA covers childbirth and related medical conditions as well. So if an employer is adding to its ADA policy, it should be sure to include not just pregnancy, but childbirth and related medical conditions. Can an employer ask for medical documentation? Um, the PWFA does not answer that question. It does not address whether an employer can obtain medical information from an employee seeking an accommodation under the PWFA. Under the ADA, we know an employer can request reasonable documentation, meaning documentation that is needed to establish that a person has an ADA disability and that the disability necessitates a reasonable accommodation, unless the disability and the need for accommodation are obvious. In many instances, a discussion with the applicant or employee 
may be sufficient and medical information may not be needed. And finally, the ADA requires employers to keep medical information confidential. Well, I appreciate you both for answering all of these questions. I learned a lot and I'm sure our viewers did too. If you want to learn more about the PWFA, please visit the EEOC's website at www.eeoc.gov or by calling 1-800-669-4000. Thank you for watching.